So we are on your biology in chapter eight, the last section, section five, on the senses and sense organs, which is a, a big um, section really, because we have a lot of sense organs in our body, including our ears and our eyes and our skin and our smell. And so we're gonna go quick, uh, quickly through these, um, but you can look at the pictures here. You can go ahead and study on your, this on your own too, if you're interested. I think this is a very interesting subject. So the senses and sense organs. So um, we're talking about these sensory receptors and what are sensory receptors? Um, they are specialized neurons divided into two broad groups. One are the somatic senses and the other are the special senses. So what are, what's somatic? What does somatic sensors mean? Well, somatic, the word means they're to detect pressure or temperature. And so all the senses of the skin and the pain receptors and everything on our skin are designed to detect extreme temperatures or injury to the body. And so we call these somatic senses. And then we have special senses. Well, special senses we know, we have sight, hearing, smell, taste, and balance are just some of our special senses. So when we talk about special senses, we're gonna talk about sense organs, such as our eyes and our ears and, you know, and our nose and such, and going on to these special senses and balance. These are all in the midst. So we have organs specifically for special senses. So now first we're gonna talk about sensations of the skin. So we going on to sensations of the skin, your pain receptors on your skin, and mechanical receptors. What are those? They, they are the receptors on our skin that, that um, have these sensations of touch, um, that we can mechanically, mechanically means something is touching us, so we know that something's touching us, right? That's those receptors. Well, let's talk about um, the sensations of the skin and the pain receptors first. We have the pain receptor, um, that for temperature. And this is a bare dendrite that reacts to the strong stimuluses, um, any strong stimulus of temperature that comes in. Can you imagine how God invented us that we could really know these extreme heat or cold temperatures that um, are rising and falling and how dangerous this is and how our skin perceives these? Hmm, so pretty amazing. And then we have again the mechanical stress the physical pain, the sharp pain that happens if you have a lot of stress on your body, like you get hit hard or such, that would be a mechanical stress. And then you have chemical, chemical stress. And these chemicals, the chemical stress, what would they be? Chemical stress being a damage to the body cells through some chemical um, reasoning. And maybe during that time, it would cause us, our skin or, or to throb or, or to be in pain with chemical stress. Mechanical receptors are responsible, we'll go down here, are responsible for touch and pressure, mechanical, as I said before. And these receptors lie at different depths in the layers of our skin. Um, the pressure are deeper, so you know, when we have receptors that are deeper, so we know that their skin is certainly under pressure. And then we have even have receptors in our muscles and tendons that will start hurting if we hurt our muscle or tendons. These are mechanical mechanical receptors, basically mechanically um, seeing that something's wrong, we have those receptors. So this picture here is pretty amazing. So this is, this is our skin, and so you can see we have the free nerve endings um, that basically are the top here, and the skin at the top, you see um, the free nerve endings that go up from here, and they um, tell for touch and pressure and pain and temperature. And then we have Messner's corpuscle. This is vibration and light pressure here so that we know on our skin. And we have a hair end organ um, here. Well, this is the hair coming down here. And to touch, you know, I guess if you pull it, you, you, you feel it, right? So here we have all these, all these little organs that are in our skin, you know, and in our dermis, our epidermis, and our dermis, in our sub, subcutaneous layer, layer. So we have these layers of our skin that tell us um, and warn us of uh, pressures. Off this Piscinian corpuscle, 
um, vibration and rapid pressure stem, um, uh, changes. These are all sensory receptors of the skin. So let's go to the next here. So going on, and we talked about these receptors, we talked about the thermal receptors, those are the heat receptors and the cold receptors and the muscle sense. And we talked a little bit about the chemical senses here. Um, and the one of the big chemical um, senses here, chemical result, the senses of taste and smell are chemical senses. So we have these um, chemical senses of taste and smell and they result from the stimulation of these chemical receptors that are on our tongue and on our nose. You know, and these are, what are these chemical receptors? Oh my goodness, we're talking about chemical receptors on our tongue and nose? Well, they're simply taste buds, which are chemical receptors. And they tell us um, basically how things are taste. And these chemical receptors are on the back and the sides and the front of our tongue. And they tell us things if they're sweet, sour, salty, bitter, or unami. What's unami? It means um, meaty, tastes like meat. And these taste buds are surrounded by epithelial cells, and so they're kind of hooked in to these areas, especially of our tongue, you know, uh, taste in the, in the um, back, in the front, in the sides of our tongue. So um, going on from the taste buds, buds, adults usually have, I like that part where it says adults usually have um, 10,000 um, of these tiny projections called um, papillae on our tongue. And these um, taste buds are replaced every 10 days. And that's so when you get older, they're not replaced so much. So your taste buds change when you get older um, simply because your taste buds are not being replaced as much as when you were young. So the same food may taste different when, when um, you are older. Also, it may taste different if you have a, a you know, dry, here's some odors here we're gonna talk about, but when you have a dry, um, dryness or moisture, you can taste the dryness, the touch, because the same receptors can tell you if something is dry or moist. And most flavors are strongly affected by odors. And that's what we're gonna talk about now, detecting odors is with the olfactory nerve. So this olfactory nerve tells us um, what kind of odors we, or odors we, we can smell. So, um, and it's important that we that we know um, these smells because they do affect our taste because most flavors are strongly affected by these order, odors. So detecting odors, um, the noise, the noise, the nose uh, sensory receptors are located in the upper pair of our nasal cavity. So in our nasal cavity, we have um, these receptors and they go to this olfactory um, nerve or I should say olfactory node nerves, you know, nerves together. And they connect the brain and the nasal cavity. So what happens? The air passes through these um, olfactory, next for the olfactories, actually the sensations of the olfactory nerve, goes to the nerve, olfactory nerve, that it goes through these olfactory, I call them, you know, and you would call them uh, uh, receptors, right? Uh, sensory receptors. I call them olfactory receptors. You know, for the olfactory, know that knows that they're they're for our odor, right? And um, they air pass throughs and they sample these chemicals in the air. So really, when you're smelling things and smelling odors, you're smelling chemicals that are in the air. And these chemicals, some of them smell awful and some of them smell good, huh? And normally, if you're exposed to these smells, these odors, for more than a few minutes your sense um, becomes temporary accommodating to the odor and you won't notice it. You wonder why you walk in a house and something smells and people living there don't even smell it? Because they're just used to it. They have been accommodated to it. So there are two types of receptors when it comes to, to smell. Um, and one, one has a certain kind of shape, you know, and the other has a senses um, through electrical, uh, electrical charges. And so you have those that um, are smelling the primary odors and those of secondary odors, which means some odors mix with the other odors causing a different odor. And humans can distinguish 10,000 different, different odors. 
So here's a primary odor, odor, which is like camphor, and then you have mothballs like there, ethanol, floral, floral is flowers, minty, oil of peppermint, musk, musky, um, pugent, uh, vinegar, sometimes some spices, or pungent, I should say, and putrid. You know, those two kind of go together. And pugent would be these two, putrid and pungent, but pungent and putrid. So, and you have those odors that we can, and we, like we have, we have 10,000 different ways to distinguish different odors. So, ears. So now let's get to the ears. This is, this is pretty interesting. So let's go on to the next page so we can see. Here we go. We're gonna focus on our picture of the ears here. So there we go. Back up a little bit so you can see the whole thing. How about there? So the, the ears are the organs of hearing. And the hearing brings us into contact with the world by our sound waves. So we're listening, or we're listening to sound waves that are transmitted in the air, and these, our our hearing comes, is our ears can detect these sound waves. Isn't that spectacular? You think, okay, this is all about invisible sound waves. If you, when it comes to it, and you think, how can we detect these? Well, God has made us in such a point that we can, and using these sound waves, we can actually communicate to each other by sound. How amazing you know and people say it just happened we just happened we just evolved to this point um no god um, is a, a very intelligent a creative creator so um the outer ear let's talk about the outer ear this area right here the outer ear is open to the outside of the body um, this is called the oracle and the oracle um, is a marvel of engineering. Why? Um, because it's able to conduct these sound waves right into our ears. It's the, it's the perfect way to capture these sound waves. The ear canal, as it goes into the outer ear canal, as it captures these sound waves and it goes through this outer ear canal, um, it's like one inch long. It's lined with thousands of little hairs. You can't really see the hairs in that picture. It has these little cilia and it has a wax gland. And the hairs and cilia that lie within here, and some people have a lot of ear hair, you know that, it, they trap like pollen and dust and things so that they don't get into our ear and cause us to get infections, right? And so now we go to this. So what is this here? Ear drum. Kind of looks like a drum, kind of sideways drum. That's why they called it the eardrum. And it's a taut membrane that stretched across the inner end of the ear like a drum. And it, it brings these sound waves bouncing against the eardrum that produce vibrations. So the sound waves are going to come here, bounce and get here, and get and produce vibrations that are cause, cause us to hear sounds. The middle ear is this section. It's kind of a small area. Um, the middle ear um, receives these vibrations of the, the eardrum and it relays it to um, through three different bones. And these bones are used to amplify the vibrations so that we can, um, we can actually hear them better. So they amplify, makes them louder, the vibrations. So they, they can be more the pitch, you can hear the pitch and the tone and all these things. So these are these little bones, perfect bones for doing the amplification job. So we have the malleus right here, and hammer, could maybe another name. We have the incus, the anvil, this is the hammer part hammering down, and the anvil, the incus hammer, and then the anvil in between, and then we have these little stirrups, they're called stirrups. So one looks like a, a hammer, one looks like an anvil, and these look like little stirrups, and they're little bones that amplify the sound. Perfect for doing that job. So as we go on now, we're going to go into the inner ear. Well, what do you notice about the inner ear? There's a huge, what does that look like? <laughs> kind of looks like a snail shell or something, doesn't it? Or, or it looks like something you'd find, a shell that you find on the beach. Well, that's why they named it a conchlea. Because that's what, that's what a conchlea is, is, is the, the shell um, of, uh, of a beach creature, you know, <laughs> that you'd find on the, the conchlea shell. 
So it looks like that. But it, as it is, you have this inner air and you have this the round circle, this inner air. Um, that is act, that's the actual organ of hearing. It's a coil, coil tube resemb, resembling this snail shell. And it has hair-like little nerve cells that line it. And they generate waves inside these tubes there causing nerves to wave. And these waves of these cells send electrical um, messages, electrical impulses, electrical, you can imagine, because of ions, let's just say. Um, and as we go through here, it's gonna basically amplify as they send it, it's going through very important, this cochlea uh, of the inner ear of hearing, wow. And uh, from the conchlium, we have the auditory nerve. Now, this is where we're talking about the neuron, nerve, that carries them to the brain. And it translates these meaningful sounds into our brain so that we can know what they mean as for communication, right? So we have this auditory nerve. See this nerve coming in here? It's a long nerve, and actually it transports um, these so that it goes all the way to our brains. And then we have the semicircular canals. What are they about? Well, um, have you ever heard when you um, feel really dizzy that it's something in your ears? Um, say you have um, vertigo, it comes from the ears. Well, it comes from these um, semicircular canals and they serve as balance sensors. And one loop goes forward, one loop goes to the side, and one loop goes down. You see how these loops are? And these, these can detect our balance, so we can make sure that we're in balance. Now, when you get an infection in your ear, you get a lot of fluid in the ear, then these semicircular canals get out of whack and they cause you to be dizzy. Uh, bone conduction, what is bone conduction? Bone conduction is when, um, say that your jaw bones, so here's your jaw bones uh, down here somewhere, um, and your jaw bones, you're speaking and all of a sudden, you're listening to your voice and your voice is traveling to your inner ear, but because, because the bone conduction interferes with it in some way or actually causes um, how you're speaking to sound a little different. So when you record your voice, you know, ever notice that you record your voice on something and it doesn't sound like it does in your ears when you're hearing your own voice and you think, is that me? That's because of the bone conduction. So, okay, the outer ear and the bone conduction, let's um, talk about uh, disease right here, disease and damage here, and you can see um, the different um, diseases here. You can't really see it on this picture, but um, so, but anyway, the disease, um, of course we have the neural deafness, which is caused by loud noises. So if you are listening to um, loud music all the time on your um, headphones, you can, this can um, destroy um, some of your um, nerves causing damage, you know, to, um, damage. So you might end up later on in life being deaf, you know, or even not able to hear some things. And then we have um, eardrum punctures. What's an eardrum puncture? I know an eardrum puncture, um, it happens and punctures your eardrum. You think, oh no, that's awful. Well, usually an eardrum, a puncture will heal heal pretty well on its own. So it's very treatable and the eardrum heal quickly. But an eardrum puncture can let in infection. So a lot of times with eardrum punctures, you might have to be on antibiotics or such or, you know, to watch that eardrum for infection. What is tinnitus? Tinnitus, and of course, um, a lot of elderly have it. In fact, you know, tinnitus can happen just um, from, um, listening to loud noises and suddenly your ears are ringing, right? So that can cause it. But tinnitus, tinnitus is, is ringing of the ears and it may be caused by fever when you have a fever. When, I, when I've had high blood pressure, my pl high blood pressure is up, I hear ringing of the ears and that could be a sign that my blood pressure is too high. And then tumors and drugs, certain drugs. Um, in fact, if you take too much aspirin or take too much ibuprofen, those kind of things can cause your ears to ring. So um, the ringing of the ears can cause, be caused by a few different things and also from loud noises. So, and the other we're gonna talk about is ear infections right here. Ear infections, we're gonna be talking about eustachian tube. So ear infections usually affect young people more because they have short eustachian tubes. Eustachian tubes, I don't know if they have the eustachian, oh, there's the eustachian tube right here. 
See the eustachian tube two, com two comes down from the middle ear. Well, this eustachian tube, you can look, you can get infections pretty easy. If it's very short, um, you're le more likely to get bacteria that can get into your ear. So and it is important. It's also important in balancing too. The eustachian tube and these stirrups are very important in both of them in, in balancing. And this is balancing though in the middle ear, and this is balancing in the um, inner ear. So um, and so if you have a problem um, with the eustachian tube, say that you're going up in a plane and all of a sudden your ears are hurting or popping, I always say to yawn or swallow to get rid of that feeling of your in your eustachian tube. So and the eustachian tube now um, we know can also cause you to get um, uh, fluid in your ears, so and cause problems with infection. So you ever feel like your ears plugged up a lot of times you need to see the doctor because you might need antibiotics, you might have infection in there. So the eustachian tube is very important. So I'm going to stop there because we are going on to the eye and it's going to take a while. This eye, there's like five pages here that talks about the eye, which is one of the most magnificent organs of our body. You know that.